So everyone, thank you for being here tonight. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having us to the Tory Birch Foundation. Um, pleasure to be here um, with both of my co-panelists. And as we all know, we're here today to talk about, about diversity and why it's so critical to our communities and organizations. But it's not always about how much a woman embraces ambition. It's also about organizations and companies creating equal opportunities, safe environments, and diverse work workforces and transparent opportunities. Anything for the sake of just doing it is not gonna get you very far. You have to really buy in and believe in a mission. And that passion, when you believe in something, is what drives change and delivers success. Diversity is not and should not be a quota. Incorporating diverse practices to include different points of view and people should be a way of life to the point that we no longer one day need the word diversity. At the end of this conversation today, my hope is that everyone who's here in this room, who's tuning in, who's listening to this conversation, who reads about it, is going to walk out of this and say that, you know what, diversity is not a buzzword, it's not a nice to have, it's a way of life. What am I going to do to make that happen? So with that, I'm going to give myself a quick, a quick introduction and then go on to my co-panelists. So I'm Shelley Kapoor Collins. I started the Shatter Fund to invest in technology companies that are founded by female entrepreneurs. When people ask me what I do, I tell them I invest. And their responses are pretty funny. Sometimes people will say, oh. And I'll say, wait, I invest in women. And, <laughs> and they'll say, oh, really? Cool. That's kind of great. But you can tell they're surprised. Women need investment. We do. So about a year ago, I'll tell you a story that, um, that kind of drove me to where I am and um, makes you realize how much of a change is needed in this space. About a year ago, I met a prominent VC and I went in to pitch her on Shatter. And um, you know, we started talking about my investment thesis and what I'm doing. And she asked me you know, at the end of it, which was a compliment, and she meant it that way, she said, you could have gotten a job with any VC in the Valley. Why'd you start Shatter? That's a good question. And so I thought about it and I told her that, you know what, you're right. I could have gone to any established organization and I could have gotten the infrastructure that was in place. But I traded that infrastructure for the ability to start my own fund because the cultural change that needs to be made has to start with me. I have to be the change that I want to see. It starts at the top and it co goes up from the bottom. And she said, I like that. She said, come back when you're <laughs> ready to start a job. And the way I see it is, I don't want a job. I want more. And that's my ambition. I want more. I always want more. Because if I want more, then the people I'm extending a hand to will also want more. So with that, um, Shatter Fund was my way of shattering the stereotype of helping women get the access to capital that they need. Um, that is my way of doing. And I'm a big believer in no op-eds there's a call to action, and my call to action is to invest in female entrepreneurs. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my co-panelist, Hadia. Hi, um, so you, as you mentioned, I'm Hadia Mujahid. I'm the CEO and founder of HBCU VC. We're a social impact mission um, where we are focused on creating more black and Latinx um, entrepreneurs, investors, fund managers, um, for the ultimate goal of creating jobs and wealth for communities of color. And I'm going to actually share a little bit story of what um, a small story of how I got to where I am today. So I'm starting to realize that my grandmother, um, my Jamaican grandmother, um, has a huge influence um, in the way that I see uh, the world and also part of my career motivations. So um, I know we're supposed to be breaking stereotypes here, but there is a Jamaican stereotype um, in this, this show called In Living Color a long time ago. I remember In Living Color. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> well, well, there was this skit about Jamaicans and um, Jamaicans having multiple jobs, right? And the joke was, uh, how, many, how many jobs do you have, right? Um, and so that was my grandmother. My grandmother, in the sense of being an entrepreneur, she had multiple uh, businesses. She ran a cleaning business where a lot of my um, aunts and uncles worked at. Uh, she ran a restaurant, which um, during the weekends, I was happy to run the cash register. Um, <laughs> and she did all this while holding down a full-time job for the city of Philadelphia. Right? 
And while um, she leveraged her position as an entrepreneur to actually help sponsor people from Jamaica to come over. And so I lived with her for a good portion of my childhood. And so there was always someone on our couch. And um, one of the things that I am learning later in life is, um, again, how my grandmother used her, her position, her privilege as an entrepreneur to put others in a place of success. And so the way that I view my work uh, through HBCUVC is that we want to create more Loretta's. Loretta's is the, is the name of my grandmother. Uh, we want to create more people like you who are using their privilege to and put you. other people's people, thank you, um, in a place of success. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. And Tracy, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy. Um, I am CEO and founder of Block Party, which is a new baby startup I just founded less than three months ago. So it's still a little bit scary to talk about. <laughs> but uh, what we're working on is tools for people who are getting harassed and abused online, uh, since there is unfortunately a lot of this um, kind of unsavoriness on the internet today, and platforms are not doing nearly enough to support people who are on the receiving end of it. How I got here is, um, in some ways, a very typical Silicon Valley story, in other ways, not so typical. So I grew up in the Bay Area. Both my parents were software engineers and have uh, PhDs in computer science. And I went to school at Stanford and studied electrical engineering, computer science there. And I did internships at Google and Facebook. So it seems very obvious that I would end up here in tech. Um, but what was a little bit unusual actually is that I felt these really strong headwinds pushing against me the whole time, even though I actually do fulfill a lot of the stereotypes, being Asian and good at math and science and engineering, um, and being very quiet. Um, it felt difficult and um, uncomfortable, and something just felt incorrect about me being in tech and in engineering, and there were a lot of little things, um, in hindsight I know, or uh, there's, I now know the terminology for all these things, like microaggressions. Um, but at the time, I didn't know what was happening. Um, and so I felt a lot of this pressure to leave tech or move into non-technical roles. Um, I eventually did end up becoming a software engineer when I graduated. Um, and it was a roll of the dice. I didn't actually know what engineering would be like. Uh, despite having two degrees in engineering, I didn't actually know what it would be like to work as a software engineer until I started doing it. So I went to an early stage startup, Quora. Um, it's a question and answer site. And I joined there um, as the third employee and the second engineer hired. And so we were really building something from the ground up. And it was that sort of marvel of creating something from scratch that um, really showed me how powerful it is to be creating technology, being in that um, driver's seat of writing the code. Mm. Um, and after Quora, I worked at Pinterest. Um, I was there also very early. I joined when it was about 10 people and left when it was about 1,000. So I got to see that sort of scaling, which was really incredible. It's a very cool Silicon Valley rocket ship story. Um, and alongside the engineering career I had, I also started doing more around diversity and inclusion unintentionally. Um, but when I was at Pinterest, which was a very supportive environment, um, I still looked around and saw that there weren't that many women in engineering, and I felt a little bit out of place. And at some point, I, um, kind of ruminating online, wrote a Medium post asking for transparency around diversity data. And uh, it was so hypocritical to me at that point that there was no data around diversity in tech companies. And we talked about it, um, but without the data, people would often say, oh, it's not really that bad of a problem, or they could kind of just paper over it. Mm -hmm. um, and once that data came out, um, we could see how bad it was and try to drive more change. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen very much progress in the last few years. Hopefully, we'll start to accelerate that. Um, but in the process of uh, that whole journey, um, working on diversity data, I also ended up co-founding a nonprofit called Project Include, which works on diversity and inclusion for tech startups. So all these different threads are coming together. So I worked in engineering, worked at platforms uh, with lots of user-generated content. I also was... Um, very intrigued by the process of designing communities and um, how to get good content and good users onto these platforms. And uh, working at Quora and Pinterest, I thought a lot about moderation and how do we set norms in these communities. Um, and some of it was because I was getting harassed on these platforms, even when they were very early. Uh, and so I've tried to build in the tools to 
block people or um, encourage more civil behavior. Um, and in the process of doing more activism work, um, I've become a little bit more uh, just active on Twitter and these from platforms and have been on the receiving end of harassment and abuse. Uh, and so now I get to take advantage of my engineering background and my experiences building platforms and the connections I've built up in Silicon Valley to actually try to solve a problem that affects me and many other people who aren't getting this problem solved. That's great, thank you, wow. So that actually brings me to my, my first question, and you've already hit on it, which is that, you know what, we knew that something needed to be done. Not much was being done. You've talked a little bit about your data collection. I would go to Hadia and say, you know, we are all people of privilege here, right? We, all, we have an education. We have the ability to impact change. Privilege means that doors open for you. You have certain levels of access. How are you, Hadia, using your privilege, which is actually power, to elevate the diversity um, dialogue that we're having into action? Um, so a couple of ways. One, through my organization, um, sharing my experiences. Uh, I, I work with students at historically black colleges and universities. Um, so sharing my experience with them, teaching them and coaching them to be the next generation of entrepreneurs and investors. So that's one way. Another way is um, platforms like this. You know, uh, sharing our story, uh, sharing our work. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's one way of uh, using our privilege uh, to, Absolutely. to direct action. I couldn't agree more. And Tracy, do you have, what more do you have to add to that in terms of how you're taking your power clearly and using it? You know, you're using it in one way, which is on social platforms, but what, are, you know, what else are you doing that we don't know about? Um, so Project Include worked with a lot of different tech startups to try to implement more diversity and inclusion best practice. Um, so we have a lot of different guidelines there and have um, programmatic offerings as well. Um, another effort I was involved with starting is something called Moving Forward. So after all the revelations around Me Too and pervasive harassment, um, this is particularly dangerous in the investing and um, entrepreneurship realm because there's no official relationship between investors and founders before an investment is actually made. So none of these relationships are protected. Um, there's a lot of harassment going on and that power imbalance of these investors holding um, capital and them being the gatekeepers to this um, money that the entrepreneurs need led to a lot of abuse in that ecosystem. Um, and so with moving forward, what we are trying to do is get venture capital firms to actually have anti-harassment policies that cover founders, which doesn't seem like it should be uh, that mind-boggling, but it turns out that m most of these firms didn't have any policies. Um, so we asked a lot of these firms, now we have over 100 firms that have uh, created and published their policies so that founders can be protected and they have points of contact to go to. So some of these things are not very exciting in some ways, like we're just trying to get them to have some sort of legal framework. Um, but, but they're so needed. Yes. Right? And you're finally, brave. someone is brave enough to talk about it and to take action and make it happen, so that's wonderful. Um, I would add to that, just because all of us, you know, both of you have more than one organization that you started, I feel the need to say that I have started another <laughs> organization. Um, but um, to answer the question of privilege to power, one thing that we've noticed is, you know, funding, you know, not only are there not enough women getting money that they need, there's not enough women being able to invest because they don't have um, the, the wherewithal. They may have the financial ability, but they don't know how to vet a deal or they don't have the access to due diligence. And so what we've decided at Shatter Fund to do is to help um, both of those very important um, ecosystems come together, the female investors and the female founders. And so therefore, in honor of International Women's Day, we're launching Shatter Syndicates. And Shatter Syndicates um, is being launched with uh, my partner, Alison Capen. If you guys know, she runs women, the Women's Startup Challenge, where it's a nonprofit. And she literally looks for um, the early stage companies that female founders that should have investment, but they don't know where to start. So she gives them that seed capital and it's a challenge. Anyway, so in honor of International Women's Day, that's our ability to take our power and to convert it into action. So thank you for that. Um, the next question I would say is, um, it's relevant to all of us, and I'd love to hear, and go back to you, Hadia. Um, all, of, all three of us here on the stage, our parents have immigrated to the US from, you know, yours from Jamaica, mine from India, yours from um, Taiwan, Tracy. Um, and to think that if our parents hadn't come here, we wouldn't be making the changes that we're making. We wouldn't have the, um, the ability to do what we're doing today, right? So you've already talked about the Loretta's of the world, but how else would you say that your parents or your family's entrepreneurial journey has, to, migration to the US has impacted your own entrepreneurial journey? 
Um, for me, I guess, leaning on my Loretta again, um, really instilling um, what I would say is a grit and hustle, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this type of work takes some type of mental toughness um, and uh, the ability to persist um, through rough times. And, you know, those are some of the things that I've uh, learned from my parents and my grandmother. And I think, you know, they've had to go through a variety of things being immigrants uh, in this country. And, and how would you say, what are some lessons that we can all learn from your parents or your family's experience? I can, I can come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So Tracy, what about you? What have um, your parents' journey to the U.S., how has that impacted your entrepreneurial journey? I mean, you touched on it in terms of it didn't always feel like you should be in tech, but what else? Well, so I think there are two very big ways in which my parents' immigration here have impacted me in terms of doing startups and being in this tech space. One is um, I feel like they set me up to have so much more opportunity than they had. Um, and... I got to grow up in the Bay Area, very middle class, had access to a great university, and then now being here, I have so much capital, so this goes back a little bit to the prior question um, of how do we use our privilege. I feel like I've been giving so much privilege, I want to pay that forward. And then the other thing um, spe specific to startups where people talk about how risky it is, uh, I just compare my situation now to where my parents were moving to a foreign country where they didn't speak the language that well, had no family here and had to build new lives for themselves. Uh, and nothing I could do right now seems anywhere near as risky as that. Um, and I just remind myself, again, this goes to the privilege point. Um, I have really good support networks and even if my startup fails, I could work on five different failed startups and I would still be okay. Um, and that pushes me a little bit to try. Um, and even though it is tougher as a woman and as a person of color, I still think it's worth it to try. You have to try, right? That's the worst thing you can do is not try. So I would, I would just add a little bit to that, which is that, you know, with my parents, when they came um, from India, you know, the first generation is all about survival in a new country, right? You take the safe jobs. You take a way that, you know, that's going to support your family. So watching my parents take that safe path kind of is reverse psychology for me. I became the person that wanted to take a risk. Right? I didn't want the safe job. I was at a company for a few years, and it never made sense to me to work for someone else. I wanted to be my own boss, and that put me on my entrepreneurial journey. But to your point, our parents gave us that foundation to be able to do so. So thank you for that. Can, can I add? Absolutely. Okay, I'm answer. <laughs> the first back. time I hesitated because I uh, thought of a non-PC term that my mom used to tell me. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't say that on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it had to do with basically you know, putting on your big girl undies mm -hmm. and um, dealing with a, a lot of things. Um, but to, to that, you know, you talked about your parents um, taking the safe job. And there were times where my parents weren't offered um, certain safe jobs, so they had to make a way. And mm -hmm. so there's a phrase of like making a way out of no way. Um, mm -hmm. And this is why entrepreneurship became a strong theme in our, in our family, because if the jobs weren't there, then they had to be creative. So I think if any lesson um, I get from my parents, it has to be the theme of being creative. Um, someone told me, and I believe this is, I don't know who originally said this, but, um, but every problem um, invites the opportunity to be creative. So. I like that a lot. And, and what you said about the hustle factor, yes, it's true that all entrepreneurs hustle, but women have to exponentially hustle harder. So I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> um, next question, Tracy, I'll come back to you. Um, what would you tell a woman who's been turned down for funding? What would be your advice? What would you tell her? She's got this amazing product, wants to go to market, and it's been turned down for funding. Where does she go from here? Um, the first thing I would say is, uh, to, I, the first thing I would do is acknowledge that there are systems that are unfair and that she should not take it too personally mm -hmm. if the system seems to be stacked against her. Sometimes it is hard to tell if you're getting discriminated against, but there's often that question still. So just to assure that there is a little of that and to not gaslight. Um, but then after that, I think it depends on 
the person what they mm -hmm. want to do. For some, it makes sense to keep pounding on more doors, and there are more and more funds out there that want to back female founders. So potentially there's a way in through one of these yeah. new seed funds. Um, I, I feel like I see a new seed fund like every week that's trying to support women and underrepresented minorities. So there's more capital now. Uh, who knows how long it will last for. Um, for others, maybe they don't want to keep pushing and they can shelve that idea, maybe come back to it a little bit later, um, get a, another job. Like There's many different potential paths and it depends on the person. Understood, I, and I agree with that. Um, this, I mean, many people in my network are turned down. Many women mm -hmm. in my network are turned down for funding all the time. Have you ever been turned down? Yes. Yeah. How did you, how did you yes. handle that? Um, what was your I advice to yourself? I think this week I was turned down for funding. <laughs> okay, so what was your advice to yourself? Uh, keep going. Yep. Just Absolutely. keep going. Um, it, I'm not going to be a fit for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not going to stop me. I'm going to be creative. Uh, when we launched our first program, we did it without program, you know, and so I was hacking together different <laughs> ideas of, okay, we're going to, you know, we, people need to understand venture capital, so I'm going to have some friends over here teach these students here, yeah. and, you know, but just keep going and find ways and opportunities to be creative. I agree with that, and, and to quote Ariana Grande, thank you, next. <laughs> so, next question. Um, this is something that, you know, clearly we're all here to discuss, but we know that diversity makes businesses more profitable. When there's a woman on the board of a company, it, is 66, it has a higher return by 66% as opposed to a non-diverse team. More effective, more sustainable, yet there are so many positives to diversity. Why is there still so much resistance, Hadia? Because uh, it takes work. It Diversity takes, takes work? Well, yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes work to, ch to change the status quo. Right, and the current um, industry, innovation in industry, was not really um, designed initially for uh, for non-white mills, um, and so there was a pattern that was set for this industry. You know how funding how funding works, how people uh, find entrepreneurs, and um, a lot of us are trying to fit in the existing. Uh, status quo, uh, but it needs to change. Um, so I think a lot of people are resistant to that because mm -hmm. they don't want to do the work. It's the unknown. They, it's the unknown. Um, and a lot of people don't want to admit that it is going to take uh, funding solutions to, to change the status quo. So hey, going to agree. commit into uh, action instead of having dialogue around it. And Tracy, I know that you've you know you've really raised the you know the profile of the issue of lack of you know lack of diversity through stats and and data. So how do you tackle this? How do you explain the resistance? I think the people who are in power right now and have privilege don't want to yield it. Even if they mm. say they do, it's very difficult to give up your position of power and privilege. And so, in addition to all the work that needs to be done, it's just very uncomfortable and difficult for people to say, I shouldn't be in this spot of power and maybe a woman of color should be instead. And so I've encountered a lot of this sort of skepticism and resistance in uh, work that I've done. And I think it comes from that um, feeling of insecurity and people wanting to believe that they own all of their success and that uh, they're there because they worked harder and they're better than the other people who aren't there. Isn't that funny? It's almost counterintuitive. You would think that the more people you let in, the more powerful you are, the more it enha enhances your brand. And yet here's the opposite of keeping people out. And I think that's a big part of what women, you know, want to do, should do for each other, right? We should be door openers, not gatekeepers for each other. So I think that's very critical. Well, I think there's something about gatekeeping, which means that your club is more exclusive. So it feels more prestigious and... I mean, even with like supply and demand economics, it can be more lucrative if, for example, in engineering, if there's not enough engineers, then each mm -hmm. engineer can make more money. So if we keep all the non-white men out, then the white <laughs> men engineers get more money. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it can definitely be exclusive, but when you're already, you know, there's only one woman at the table or you're fighting for that seat at the table, I think that that is where, um, the problem comes in and the gatekeeping comes in and that's where we need to open doors. So thank you for that. Um, Gitanjali touched on this earlier in her question and her answer about 
you know, imposter syndrome, right? So we've all been a minority in the room, at the table. Um, just give me quickly um, just something, how you've successfully pushed through um, being, feeling like the imposter or the self-doubt. Well, I think to myself, what would Beyonce do? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and 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 I and I mean that I'm not uh, I'm not a big uh, Beyonce stan. I mean she's she, she you know she's a she's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I watched this interview like I mean this was years ago. But she talks about her being like really sh like her natural personality is like really shy. She talks about that's where Sasha Fierce comes through. And so I know that there are times where um, the self doubt comes in, and it's and a lot of times it's unfounded, right? So I have to push on myself, you know, play my, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the, sorry. You're the who rules the world? No, or who rules the world? <laughs> you know, put on my music, anything that to, to make whatever Sasha Fierce, to, to bring out the Sasha Fierce in me. So. That's, that's great. And whatever it takes to get you to the next day, right? And, and Tracy, what about, you know, for the men in your life, like the, that are in your life, what advice would you give them to be supportive to women? especially in this time of the Me Too movement that's happening across you know, industries, every industry, venture, capital, politics, tech, <laughs> education, entertainment? I think first, really seek to understand the experience of women um, and do more than just like Facebook statuses and retweet. Yes. I feel like I get a lot of that from people who, pretend that they care a lot, but then don't actually do anything about it, um, and act very surprised to hear some of these stories. Um, and in particular, the people who have never heard of a woman in their life getting harassed before, the question I would ask is, why don't the women in your life feel comfortable telling you these stories? And how can you position yourself so that you can start to hear them more and understand how you can actually be helpful? Um, I think. That's very fundamental. And then for organizations and actually like longer term change, I think now there are more um, men who are in positions of power where they can make hiring decisions um, or leadership decisions that could be beneficial to women, but they don't have networks that are more diverse. And so when they're thinking of who to bring on as a partner or who to hire into some, um, some role, they don't know the people mm -hmm. to bring in at that time. And so even though they're looking at that point for someone from different backgrounds, they don't have those networks yet. And so I think it's a very long-term um, fix that we need to create culturally. And one thing you can start doing now is spend time with people who aren't like you and start building those connections. You understand those people and also just get to know them as people. And in the future when there are opportunities um, where you can give them out or help people into them, um, you have a more diverse network to share that with. That's great, and, and I, if I had to ask each of both of you to give me your number one action that people in this room can take, who are, and people that are you know, tuning in through live streaming are gonna go back and watch these videos, what would it be for them to join you in your mission and to help you become successful? Give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only half joking, um, but no. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, um, the work that we all, are doing, yeah. um, there's some type of investment that needs to, to go behind it. So um, we are a nonprofit, so um, donations are always appreciated, even if it's like $5 or $10. Um, but outside of that, I think just um, creating a general awareness of this industry, um, venture capital itself is very uh, opaque. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs who are seeking funding um, don't quite understand the industry. Um, so, you know, spend some time educating yourself on, um, you know, the venture capital industry and the way it works in terms of, you know, term, term sheets, how to uh, evaluate your, your startup, um, the different financing op options, um, understanding that every VC has a different investment thesis. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the one thing that I see a lot of times people go and say, they won't fund me, they won't fund me. And it's like, well, if you have a software startup, you shouldn't be going to hardware investors. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, you know, outside of giving me your money, um, just, you know, spending some time educating yourself, especially in teaching others about this industry. Excellent. Thank you. Tracy, your number one thing, how can we help? 
I don't have a very good concrete action item here, but one thing I want to point out is that people will often talk about diversity and inclusion as a priority, but that is meaningless unless it is prioritized above something else. And so I think it's instructive to consider the decisions you're making where diversity and inclusion could be prioritized above something else and think about making those trade-offs. So it might mean that you have to hire more slowly because you're trying to ensure a more diverse uh, employee base, or it might mean that you don't choose to work at a company that is bad towards women and minorities, even if that offer is more attractive. Um, there's many different ways you support with where you um, purchase things from. Are you, are you supporting women and minority-owned small businesses? Just think about all the different choices you're making and where you can actually support diversity and inclusion and prioritize it. Excellent. Thank you. And of course, invest, invest, invest in women. So, and thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.